Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session at Innovation 2023, looking at innovation in procurement in government. My name is Richard Johnston. I'm the executive editor of Global Government Forum, and we have a great panel with us today to uh, discuss this very important topic. And it is very important because procurement is among the most vital activities that a government undertakes. We definitely saw this during the coronavirus uh, pandemic when procurement was crucial to both buying the protective equipment for frontline staff and to ensuring the supply of vaccines once one became available. Um, procurement is also key to the challenges the government faces in the future from catalyzing the drive to net zero. And it does touch on all kinds of innovation. We've already heard it mentioned in the fireside chat session today, um, the opportunities and perhaps also some of the challenges that procurement uh, places in the innovation process. So we want to discuss the role of procurement in government innovation today, and we have a fantastic uh, panel of speakers to do so. Um, and thanks to, to our knowledge partner for this session, SAP, for supporting us. Um, we will also have time for questions at the end. So can I ask you all to be uh, thinking about anything you would like to ask our panel? Um, and let me introduce them to you. Uh, we're going to hear some sh short opening thoughts from each of them, but I shall introduce them uh, now in turn before we hear those. Uh, we're joined by today, uh, starting first, Dag Stromness, the Chief Procurement Officer and Director in the Division for Public Procurement in the Norwegian Agency for Public and Financial Management. So, hello, Dag, thank you for joining us. We've also joined by Martin Ledelter, the Managing Director in the Federal Procurement Agency in Austria. Hello, Martin. Uh, we are joined also by Gerard O'Rourke, the Account Executive for Intelligence Spend Management at SAP, our knowledge partner for this session. Uh, with us too is Christina Kiverand, the Head of Procurement and Quality at the Estonian Stockpiling Agency in Estonia. And uh, we're also joined, last but not least, by Gal Amir, the Head of Governmental Procurement Administration in the Ministry of Finance in Israel. So as I said, we're going to hear some short opening uh, thoughts from our panelists on innovation in procurement, and then uh, we will have questions. So please, as I say, do uh, have some thoughts on that. And I'm going to ask Dag to speak first. Dag. Thanks a lot, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks a lot for the invitation to come to speak at the Global uh, Government Forum. Uh, I'm very pleased that I could share some experiences with innovative public procurement in Norway, which is actually is one of my favorite topics in relation of procurement, how to improve the procurement to get more innovation, both to improve the public service delivery, but also to encourage growth in the private sector. You know that Norway is quite a rich oil country, but the oil will not last forever. We need to develop new industries, and I think that innovative public procurement is one important tool in that manner. I think that around 15% of our GDP goes through central and local government procurement. And it really demonstrates the huge potential uh, this demand power has to develop the products and the services in more innovative way. We could hardly also imagine the Green Deal, the Green Shift, without innovative public procurement. We need to encourage to make new products, new services with uh, uh, a better CO2 emission uh, record. And we also could ask for products and services where we have a key target and a work criteria related to the CO2 emissions. So I think innovative public procurement and the green challenges go hand in hand. We could also hardly imagine the way to change into circular economy without promoting new ways of doing the businesses and to use the experiences from the supplier side to encourage 
to move from a linear economy into new ways of doing cir circular economies to reduce the waste involved in the, the production. I'd also like to mention uh, that we have the startups. Uh, I think the startups are a really good source of innovation that actually the public sector needs. I think the startups have knowledge of the latest te technology and have new solutions that can help to solve public sector needs. At the same time, traditional procurement processes are often complicated and long-lasting, as it was mentioned in one of the sessions uh, earlier today. And also the public sector are not used to deal with these startups. They are used to deal with these more traditional suppliers with more resources. Uh, and they also have a little overview about what the startup can offer. And our project is called Start Off. It's a tool to address actually this challenge through a fast, simple, and predictable process. The startup brings the public clients and the startups together to solve the challenges public sector needs and help growing new businesses. This uh, system, this start-off system, is the, developed as the new standard model for a six months fast track pre-commercial procurement inspired projects. And we also select projects that has the potential for developing further uh, into uh, bigger businesses that could uh, expand and do businesses just not uh, in relation to public procurement. Uh, we have just started this work. I think we have 10, 12 projects that has gone through this uh, process that has been very well uh, uh, taken care of, or, or um, I think it's very popular in, in Norway, but it's also recognized within Europe. And I was very proud that we, last December, in uh, the big meeting for the European Innovation Council, got the, the, was awarded with the gold medal for the European uh, Government leaders, Procurement Leadership Award for this project. So uh, if you are curious to know more about this start-off work and how we connect the public sector and the startups in, in a good way, we are very happy to, to share some uh, experiences with you. Thanks a lot for me at this time. Great, thanks very much, Dag. Really interesting thoughts on the um the potential, I think, for, for procurement to solve a lot of uh, public policy challenges. Um, and I'm going to come to, to Martin uh, to uh, secure some open comments next. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Um, I almost feel guilty having traveled to London because it's more pleasure than business. So thank you very much for that chance. I would like to um, speak a little bit, bit about how we were able to integrate innovation and sustainability into the core process of the Austrian Federal Procurement Agency. Some 10 years ago, and in line with Austria's strategic action plans, we created two departments for both innovation and sustainability. And from the very beginning, we tried to intertwine those two departments with everything else we are doing for public procurement. Phase one is a support process where we try to identify the potential needs of our customers even before they are aware of their very needs. We do that by means of a structured dialogue, by uh, working groups with our partners in ministries, in municipalities and uh, provinces. We then try to lay the groundwork and prepare the very topic we're about to engage in. Phase two then is an exploration phase so as to recognize the very potentials of innovation. We commence innovation scouting and market exploration and we prepare the very business cases and models, uh, do the due diligence so as to scrutinize uh, the potential analysis. We then start so-called innovation challenges, and we'll get back to that a little later, and start workshops 
to attract as many suppliers as possible for our customers. Phase three then is a preparation uh, process. We prepare the tenders and the supporting strategy documents. We engage in market talks. We pursue both EU and uh, domestic objectives. We do a needs assessment approach. And uh, of course, we try to supply as much procurement uh, support to our strategy teams. Phase four is the process when we try to engage into the implementation, implementation of the tender and uh, the technical support that is uh, necessary for that very reason. Uh, we accompany all our core departments with the expertise from both innovation and sustainability and also provide contract documentation for as to what is necessary to fulfill innovation and sustainability criteria. The uh, award criteria and the contract conditions are also then uh, again assessed by our sustainability and innovation uh, teams. Phase five is then the very contract management. Um, in Austria, we provide the only e-commerce platform for public customers. And by public, public customers, I mean federal ministries, state ministries, ministries, uh, province, provinces uh, and municipalities, as well as companies held by the Republic of Austria. Um, we have both an innovation and sustainability filter in our electronic shop, our e-commerce platform. We actually label the very products and services that uh, we consider sustainable and innovative. And we also have a so-called innovation and sustainability world in our e-commerce platform. All that enable, enables us to actually fulfill the social political procurement goals and the innovative and sustainable goals that we are about to set. Excellent. Thank you, Martin. That's really great insight into some process tips there and how you can actually implement these kind of innovations, which is, is fantastic and exactly uh, the theme of today's conference. That's brilliant. I will definitely want to pick your brains on some of those <laughs> um, when we proceed into the questions. Uh, Gerard, I'll ask you to share some of your thoughts. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm not a procurement practitioner, like many of you in the room, uh, but I have been involved in procurement technology for the last 12 years. So what I'm going to talk about now really is, I guess, is a point of view, some observations, some key themes, if you like. Um, you got, you got to put the slide on. Thank you. Uh, so um, the theme really for, for this particular part of the session is something I've framed the seven C's of procurement. So there are only seven C's, as we all know, but there are pl plenty more C's in procurement. Uh, but for, for the sake of consistency, we're talking about seven C's today. Uh, and I'm framing it both in the old world and the new world. So when we talk about the old world, you know, we're talking about the three C's of cost, control, and compliance, uh, which of course procurement have been doing for decades now and is still relevant today. Uh, and in fact, some of the statistics uh, up on the slide there are from a survey that we commissioned with Economist Impact last year, where we interviewed 360 different CPOs uh, based on their priorities and focuses for 2023. Uh, and as you can see there, 48% still cite cost saving as a focus area for 23. So that's not going away. Um, and, and of course, cost savings can be achieved in many different ways from, from sourcing and, and managing contracts, et cetera, but it's not new information for you. Um, what I am gonna focus on today is four uh, additional Cs that we're seeing playing out um, within our customers and, and within the market. Uh, interestingly, you probably spotted that one of those Cs doesn't feel too new. Uh, and you're absolutely right, contracts has been around for, for decades as well. Um, but my question is how many organizations here are actually getting value from their contracts? Um, 
you've spent months negotiating that contract only for it to be put into a filing cabinet, never to see the light of day until your office move. Uh, so what a lot of our organizations are looking to do is to embed the contract into their entire source to pay process. Um, in that way, by allowing consumers or your end users to be able to purchase goods and services based off that contract, based off the pricing that you've negotiated and the terms that you've negotiated, is the only way that you'll be able to realize the savings that you negotiate up front. So that contract becomes almost the pivot between the strategic sourcing process and the operational procurement process and brings those two processes together so that you're getting the benefits of all the work you're doing up front at, at, the, at the bottom end for your end users. So contracts is not new, but we could be doing an awful lot more to get value from those contracts. Um, the second point then is around collaboration. I think uh, Dag mentioned it already as a really important part that you know, our suppliers want to do more with you. They, they want better relationships, they want to increase their wallet share if they're performing well, um, and they want the ability to be able to transact digitally with you. There's a benefit on both sides to do that. Um, a, you'll start to see more of the innovation that your suppliers are driving towards, uh, but also from a supplier's perspective, they're able to acknowledge and, and ship those orders more, more effectively, more time efficiently, uh, for you to be able to get the benefit of those goods and services. And ultimately, the supplier wants to be paid on time, which of course, uh, as buyers, you all want to strive for as well. Uh, and that's really only possible in, in a digital world. Uh, and then the final two Cs really are around your end users. So your thousands of people that you employ today uh, and their interaction with procurement. So from an end user perspective, all they want to do at the end of the day is to be able to find, buy, and requisition the goods and services that they need to do their jobs. Now, historically, that's not always been straightforward. Uh, and in fact, it's led to a lot of maverick spend because if they can't find what they're looking for, it's not available, they'll go off and use a supplier that they know about or they'll go down to the, the corner shop and buy what they need. So providing an easy way for end users to find those goods and services and buy those goods and services is essential to locking in the savings negotiated at the strategic sourcing process. Um, you know, it's always said to me, why should a business user have a different experience to the experience that you have at home? So when you're at home, you know you can go onto a site today, find what you're looking for, compare it to other products, make sure it's the right specification, and then make the purchase and have all the shipping information around that so you know when it's coming. Shouldn't be any different in the business world. Uh, and then the final element is something that Martin uh, alluded to is around conscience. So as part of our, the, the ESG uh, objective that your organization might have, um, data is obviously a key part of that, and I'm sure we'll talk more about it during the session. Um, but also, from a, if you think about the talent coming to your organizations, they want to be part of that conversation. They want to be part of the, you know, how your organization is actually supporting uh, diverse suppliers, local suppliers, um, different types of um, sustainability criteria. So really what we're looking to do really is give those users the information that they need to make those informed decisions. So we're not mandating anything. We're not saying they have to buy those particular goods and services because they meet the criteria that we've set out. But at least they've got the information they need to do the right thing for them, uh, which ultimately will do the right thing for your organization. So, uh, so you might not agree or disagree with everything, but I thought some interesting points of view just on some of the themes uh, that we're seeing within our customers today. Great, thanks, Gerard. I'm sure we'll uh, pick up on some of those uh, in the questions. Um, I'll ask uh, Christina to share some uh, opening comments. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My topic today is uh, about delegated inventory contracts. And uh, that is the type of contract uh, on the basis of which the tenderer or uh, inventory holder undertakes the obligation uh, to form, uh, manage and maintain the stocks and the uh, contracting authority, um, um, I'm sorry, has the right to uh, acquire the inventory freely and uh, without restrictions at any time. Uh, Estonian stockpiling agency uh, uses uh, delegated inventory contracts uh, because we want to ensure the supply security at optimal costs. 
under delegated inventory contract, we pay to inventory holder uh, for storage uh, service and some percent of capital expenditure, but we don't have to pay for goods itself. And also we don't need to deal with rotating to ensure the appropriate expiration date of the goods. Estonian stockpiling agency pays monthly fee to the inventory holder. And this fee includes inventory formation, holding, preservation, renewal, accounting, and reporting. And also procurer has priority right to buy out the goods. Uh, the products specified in the contract uh, must not be covered by any other contract. Uh, the entire product list and quantities must be guaranteed and reserved exclusively to Estonian stockpiling agency. Using delegated contracts is not spread practice, uh, so we have a very important task to clarify the conditions of delegated contracts in Estonian market to the stakeholders. For that, we usually arrange the meetings for companies operating in the specific field before we announce the tender. Conducting the procurements, we used a lot of derogations or exceptions in the meaning of Estonian Procurement Act and uh, due to security measures we have to follow because our procurements contain much of the classified information like content of the contracts and data of our contracting partners. And in the future, we are planning to ensure the supply security with production capacity guarantee agreements. For this, however, it is necessary for Estonian stockpiling agency to develop cooperation uh, with the private sector and obtain the necessary consent of Estonian government. Thank you, yeah, thank you, Christina. Really useful. Um, insight into a particular uh, innovation there. Um, I'm sure people would be keen to hear more. Uh, and finally, in their, the opening remarks, I'll ask Galf. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to be here. I want to share with you about our journey to the public cloud. In Israel, in the last few years, we established a main project called Project Nimbus, in which we, the providers were going to build an infrastructure in Israel AWS and GCP, and in the last year we are heavily invested in a new tender, a central tender, in which we are want to uh, be able to procure third-party services for the government to use. Uh, what is special in this uh, tender is that it's an evergreen tender. It's going to be renewed every, every few months, and in this uh, tender we are going to buy all the third-party services within the uh, public uh, procurement uh, uh, markets of the GCP and AWS. Uh, the government is very, uh, excuse me, just a minute. We are, very we are very happy that we are able to conduct this tender and, and our main goal is to create a platform in which the ministries can be able to procure all kinds of third party services, SaaS and non-SaaS for the government and this is the way we are going to do it, so I'm very happy to share it with you. Great. Thank you very much, Gal. Really interesting uh, project there, and uh, it touches on something, um, procurement of services as opposed to procurement of goods. That I think is a very interesting topic, and I might uh, get the questions on that. But I will throw it open to the floor now and stand up here so that these lights blind me a little bit less and see if anybody would like to ask any Questions for our panel. We've got one there and one down at the front here. Um, I'm David Brown. I'm from Oxfordshire County Council, and I work for the Innovation Hub. And one of the biggest challenges that we have is actually taking an innovation project and moving that into business as usual. Um, that's probably one of the most painful things that we have to do all the time. So I'm wondering if anybody has any thoughts about how maybe you've done it before or how you've set up some, some sort of a, a standard process or procedure that actually makes that easier. Because we're all here talking about innovation and it's great and we can go out and we can find you know, private sector companies to work with to solve really 
complex problems in, in unique ways, but then the project just dies because we get public funding, we get grants, whatever, that will pay for a three month or a six month period. And then after that, it's just like, oh, well, that was great, but we don't have any money and we don't have any way to move that into sort of production, if you want to think about that. So I'd be interested in any thoughts that anyone has. Great, thank you. I'll take uh, two questions so we can get around more um, people. There's uh, one question there. The gentleman with his hand up. Uh, yeah, good morning. It's still morning, just. Uh, my name's um, Ian Brotherston. I work for Innovate UK, the UK government's innovation agency. So pleased to hear um, Dag, I think it was, talk about pre-commercial procurement, which is something which is well hidden in the UK because it's not in the procurement regulations, but the UK does have a pre-commercial procurement program, Small Business Research Initiative, which I deliver for the UK government, and we work across UK government um, agencies. Now, my question is actually a little bit um, related to David's, but it was about how we get pre-commercial procurement um, more embedded in the business as usual way of thinking of the public sector, whether that's central government departments or whether that's local authorities. Great, thank you very much. Two questions about embedding innovation in uh, business as usual. Um, I'll go to Martin first, because as I said, I thought you, your um, points on process were really interesting. How did you embed those, Martin? Uh, I think there are two very good questions that are uh, raised. Uh, I think we, uh, we really need to try to uh, mainstream and make more standard procedures. Uh, but I think the challenge with uh, innovative public procurement is that when you are a public buyer, you need to understand the market. Uh, you need to have a market sounding. Uh, how could the suppliers in the best way uh, deliver on what you actually need? Uh, on the other hand, how is the procurement community actually looking? I think in Norway, and I think uh, and also in many of the OECD countries I'm working very close with, I think we have a lack of capacity. We have a huge number of procurement processes that are waiting in line. We need to use the budget before the year ends. Mm. So uh, to take your time to really understand how you could develop your procurement process to really get as much as possible out of the potential suppliers uh, is, uh, is really challenging. But I think we need to work hard to make uh, guidance. We need to develop a good understanding uh, about how the different markets are, are working. And I also think that the public sector need to work together to collaborate and share experiences to if so we could get um, uh, to realize the, 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 the potential from the suppliers and to innovative public procurement. Thanks, Doug. Do you, Martin, do you want to come in? Well, thank you very much. I don't think there's a standard solution. Austria has perhaps gone a very peculiar way um, and uses Austria's federal procurement agency so as to mediate between the public sector and the private sector. We actually are a limited liability company, um, which allows us to take more risks, not be as risk averse as the public sector usually is. And we do not have the worries to fail as much. We can circumvent certain obstacles. We can uh, spend more money than uh, the public sector. We are not bound by fiscal restraints as much as the public sector is. And We've heard about the speed that uh, is necessary for innovation to bring new markets, uh, new products to the markets, ASAP. And by means of innovation scouting, by means of innovation challenges, I think we're able to do just that. Yeah, excellent. I'll bring the rest of the panel in momentarily. I just want to get two more questions. One there at the front row, the lady and the other lady here. Hi, it's probably a question for, um, is it Dag, 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 hi, um, around the implementation of the startup scheme. I, noting 
obviously Norway has a slightly separate procurement regime. How did you, in the pre-commercial space, align the regulatory requirements with the scheme itself, and how does that work in the context of public procurement rules? Exactly the question. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, so what I mean is obviously we have uh, procurement rules that set out yeah. what we have to do in terms of process mm. and not everything is set out in rules, which I think my colleague recognised here. Mm. But just really interested to hear more about how you um, align the regulatory environment yeah. with that startup scheme, because mm. I think that's fascinating, that mm. idea. But obviously that would come with risk. Yeah. Um, so I was just curious to yeah. know more. Great, and we'll have a second question here. I'll let you touch on that dag um, momentarily. Yes. Good morning. Um, this is quite an open question. So with the United Nations statement yesterday about asking all governments to bring forward by 10 years environmental policies, how do you think that's going to sort of affect and change procurement in each of your uh, governments. And just reflecting around, you know, budget spends that we're often encouraged to spend a budget by the end of the term, or around stockpilings. So how do you think that will be affected? So quite an open question, I know. Thank you very much. I'll start at this end of uh, the panel on, on that point and then allow Dag to respond to the specifics. Uh, Gerard, do you want to touch on the, any thoughts on the yeah. sustainability aspect and, and what, what it means? Yeah, yeah it, it's a great topic. I mean, ESG has been a buzzword in the industry, uh, in the technology industry at least, for, you know, for some time, for a few years. Um, and not many organisations know what to do about it, to be fair, because the data is not available. Um, they're not quite sure how they're, how they're going to report on it, what to ask their suppliers for, etc. So um, we are seeing some innovations now in this space uh, to support, uh, support both buyers and suppliers, actually. So, um, you know, buyers want the data so they can start understanding, you know, not only who they're spending with, but whether those suppliers actually meet some of the qualifying criteria around ESG. So what we're putting in place is... Um, like, this has been in place for some time. We've got the world's largest business network, for example, with millions of suppliers on it. And we recognize that the data is inconsistent uh, for suppliers because they're not being asked the same questions. Uh, and sometimes they feel, even though they have one too many relationships on the network, they feel that they're answering the same sort of question, but in a different way. So we're introducing something um, as an example called our human rights values uh, questionnaire. Uh, which is based on UN guidelines, which is based on um, a lot of the core criteria around human values, whether that's um, child labor, uh, source of supply, et cetera. So we're standardizing that process for our suppliers, which means then that they can offer that to their buyers as a standardized uh, template, um, which means that they can be more attractive to potential buyers in the market because they've actually they can see that they've met that, that criteria. They've got a, they've got a flag to say, uh, you know, we've got we've got that passed on on the network. Uh, and then from a buying community, it means that they can quickly identify and qualify suppliers that meet some of those um, some of those objectives. So it's it's not you know it's not going to be easy because the data is inconsistent. Um, but there are ways, if we can start standardizing that data and making it consistent for everyone, for buyers and suppliers, then we can suddenly get into a place where we've got a better handle on, on those ESG objectives. Thanks very much. And uh, Christina, how, how does sustainability match in with the, the, the delegated procurement processes that you were uh, discussing? Sustainability? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, in Estonia, our desirable outcome is uh, always the savings of money. And, um, but we also, uh, uh, we must uh, assure that the quality must be appropriate, but uh, sustainability, it costs much. And uh, we just don't have this kind of money. Interesting. And Gal, do you have any reflections on um sustainability in terms of the cloud element. I know, I know there's often a lot of press around cloud computing sustainability and things like that. Is that something that was considered in, 
in your uh, processes? Gal? I think that uh, in Israel we just started to create new models that within the models we want to try and bring some parameters of sustainability like uh, carbon dioxide uh, and, and things like that. We're just in the beginning of the process. Mm -hmm. It's still in, uh, it's a hard one because as uh, my colleague said, we don't have the data and it's also inconsistent when we have the data. So it's a, it's a long process that we are just, just starting. But I'm sure as my colleague said that it will be one of the major issues in the, last few, in the next few years also in Israel. Uh, Dag, I'll let you come back on the yes. specific question you were asked about um, the procurement rules and regulations. Yes, thanks a lot for your uh, very good question. And uh, Norway is uh, part of the European economic area and we are, have to follow the European rules and regulation in, in, in procurement. So uh, all the procedures and all the ways we are doing needs to be in accordance with the, with the rules and regulations. Uh, but we do it within the, 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 the pre-commercial uh, procedure and uh, we invite uh, startups uh, to, to, to take part, to qualify for the projects. We qualify four to six, they get uh, uh, around 5,000 euros each to develop the, 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 the idea and we award uh, one of them uh, at the end, and then we're talking about this uh, MVP or uh, minimum viable project that we that we continue with. But what we actually uh, are struggling a little bit with that uh, there are not so big uh, amount involved, uh, but we can could not guarantee that there are just startups that is going to ask to take part in the projects. So uh, actually there's one project where it was um, uh, a mid-sized company that got the contract, but, uh, we are, but we are promoting it and we are really encouraging the startups to, 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 to join our, our competitions. But uh, we have been actually struggling quite a lot to, to, find, to define the good procurement routes uh, towards this, but uh, we will be happy to share uh, our experiences and our approach. Great, um, thank you very much, Dag. And yes, if you do see any of the speakers um, around, everybody uh, can chat at lunchtime. We'll maybe take one last quick question there, the lady at the end, but these are gonna be very quick questions because um, I think we're almost up against time. Yes. Maya. Hello, Diana Richards from the Ministry of Justice Innovation Team. So often in the innovation process, um, procurement could be a barrier to innovation, especially in the early stages of prototyping and piloting because of the rules and the processes that need to be followed. Do you have, based on your experience, any tips or any things that you've done to perhaps design a lighter touch process for prototyping, piloting, MVPs that would be less, you know, stringent and more would encourage innovation in these early phases? Thank you. Who wants to take that in the first instance? Do you want Gal to go first? We have a, we have a solution that calls a, a challenge tender, which create we are pro providing the suppliers with the, with the question and asking them to answer it and give us the solution, in which the solution is can be a prototype, it can be a, a proof of concept, everything such as. And then after we finalize the procedure, we can decide which solution to take without uh, designing it in advance. So it's a very efficient way to be able to answer innovation in this sort of way. Mm. Christina, do you have any thoughts on that? We'll just run down the panel for any closing thoughts on that uh, last question. Yes, uh, in Estonia, we just uh, have to uh, follow the uh, procurement rules uh, and uh, uh, the guidelines of Estonian uh, government and uh, we have to use uh, Estonian procurement register to uh, process our procurements but um, Estonian stockpiling agency uh, uh, uses much of uh, derogations which are the exceptions like. Jared, do you have any thoughts on that last uh, closing well, question? It, it's a great question because it lends itself to one of the themes I brought out earlier, which is around collaboration. Um, 
and having suppliers engaged at that early part of the process is, is phenomenal. It, mm -hmm. you know, it will drive innovation, it will drive successful outcomes. Um, and I'm not, I'm not really here to talk a re much about the solutions today, but um, there are capabilities now that are out there that allows that very, very quick collaboration, that connectivity between you and your suppliers to build those prototypes out, to test them, um, to analyze them, uh, and to ensure that the, the costing is right as well. So um, that is a relatively new area within the last couple of years in terms of technology, but um, a lot of organizations are now embracing that because the, the value that that delivers from a cost saving, but also from a getting the right product that you're looking for um, is key. So yeah, you're on the right track. Mm. Martin, any thoughts on how to embed innovation? Well, sure, Alex Chisholm today said that uh, not all attempts at innovation are successful. And that is the truth. Uh, we launch about five innovation challenges every year pertaining to a, ver you know, a variety of topics. But we've learned that 70% of the challenges eventually are being implemented or will be implemented. And the scaling up um, potential of these innovation challenges and the very you know, products are simply amazing. We're currently doing uh, a challenge with the Austrian uh, highway authorities where we try to do photovoltaic systems on 1,500 kilometers on, um, on noise barriers so as to provide electricity for their infrastructure. So the potential is absolutely amazing. Don't be afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. And finally, Dag, I'll give you the last and, if I may say, short words <laughs> to include our session. No, but, uh, but uh, I think um, the question is, 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 uh, is very good. And uh, I would just repeat that the importance of uh, market sounding, how to, to have the dialogue uh, with the market, how could you uh, best deliver, what kind of risks should be transferred to the supplier, what kind of risks should, should be uh, at the contracting uh, office. Uh, I think we have a good opportun opportunity to have quite a broad dialogue with potential suppliers. But we need to take into account that they are not going to have a com competitive advantage without going to compete with the other suppliers. But uh, I think we need to, 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 to use this market sounding uh, element uh, a bit uh, wider. And, uh, this could be supported by uh, the, our experiences with uh, different partnerships arrangements to, to, to get in touch, uh, develop the model together. And, uh, uh, but for, from my point of view, I think dialogue is the, 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 the key word within a competitive framework. Thanks very much, Doug. Um, and uh, it has to be short words at the end from everyone because we're up against time. Thank you very much to our panel for taking part in, in this session. I thought it was really interesting, a lot of uh, really useful examples there. And as I say, if you do see any of our speakers around um, and you want more information, do call them at lunch. I'm sure that's, um, that's all right. Um, thank you uh, to all of you for coming along and for your questions. And thank you to our knowledge partner, SAP. We're now straight on to another session. We have innovation in inclusion right here and innovation in artificial intelligence in the Great Hall. But if we can all just thank our panel for taking part. Thank you. Thank you.